Well, this is an overwhelming crowd. <laughs> uh, it was, it was uh, advertised as a question and answer session, so I didn't come with any preconceived ideas about what I would say or what I would talk about. So um, how, do you all have any questions or any comments about how your season went? Bob, did you say that the, the basswood, did it overlap the sourwood? Did the basswood overlap the sourwood? Yeah, it really did a little bit. There were several days mm -hmm. when both were coming in. Okay. And it, it's so, you know, if you only got a few colonies, it's easy to pull that basswood, basswoodish honey off at just the right time and mm -hmm. let the rest be sourwood. For us, it's tricky. We had 2,000 colonies we had to go through. I mean, you know, what do you, you can't do that in one or two days. So we had about a five day interval there where we were trying to, uh, I mean, we were working a lot of yards every day, getting supers off and fresh ones on, and it was pretty tricky. And I think we kept the basswood out for the most part. I think we got a little bit of clover in our sourwood. And our sourwood was actually a little darker in color this year, and I'm convinced it was not sumac. Some years, sumac is the culprit when you get sourwood that's a little darker than normal. Um, some years, the sourwood just comes in as a different color all by itself. I've had very light sourwood, not common, up in this area or in my area of northern Rabin and southern Macon County. The sourwood usually has some color. Um, I know over in Hiawassee and some areas over by Lake Lure and that way, you know, they get really light sourwood. I rarely get that. And uh, it, 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 you know, I, I, I work really hard to keep the sumac out. And uh, so our, our sour was just simply darker this year. Little, and I, maybe it's my imagination, but it seems to be a little thinner consistency uh, than like a wildflower or something like that. The sourwood this year yeah. was thinner? Do you yeah. Well, you know, high humidity does that. I mean, we, we try to counteract that with our warming drying room, you know. And we got our sourwood down around 16.2, 16.4% moisture. But when it came in, it was in the low to mid-18s, which yeah. is, you know, it won't ferment at that. But uh, we try to pull our moisture down for several reasons, not just to make absolutely sure that it won't ferment. I actually think it makes a better product. I think it has more character. Uh, the, I think the flavor is more distinct. I think that thicker honey is just better. And it's more, it, it's a little more stable on the shelf as far as, you know, deteriorating. And uh, I really like thick honey. You and you that's pulling moisture? We pull moisture out of our honey. We actually do something that would be considered odd to most beekeepers. We leave our, uh, when we pull our crop in when it's still partially on capped, maybe 25% or 30% on capped, we do that on purpose so we can pull it into our drying and warming room, which is a very low humidity, real warm air. Uh, we try to get the humidity below 30% and the air up around 85 or 90, and then we have uh, industrial fans in the ceiling blowing down through the stacks of supers. And it, 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 um, the on-capped honey is the part that gets uh, thicker very fast within just a few days under those conditions you can take 18% uh, moisture honey down to 13 or 14. And then when you extract, that blends with the capped part, which was affected very slightly, and you end up with this 16, 17 type of stuff, which in my view is ideal. Um, uh, oddly enough, uh, some people won't buy this, but moisture will migrate through cappings also. It just takes a very long time. If you put capped honey in a very dry, warm environment with fans, Leave it there long enough, eventually you'll pull a little moisture out, but nothing like what you do when it's on capped. I recommend that to everybody. I, I'm, you know, if you live in an arid area like Arizona or Southern California or, you know, parts of Texas, you don't have to worry about that at all. But we're just so humid here. 
you know, if you uh, extract your honey in your garage and the humidity is the same as it is outside, there's a real good chance you're adding moisture to your honey because, you know, honey, honey is hygroscopic. And uh, the, the magic uh, spot to be, uh, where the, the line where above it gains water and below it loses water, in my view, is about 58 to 60 percent humidity. Uh, this summer, I woke up to a lot of days that were 95 to 100 percent humidity. I'd say most days, you know. Um, of course, by midday, it, once it warms up, the warm air holds more moisture, so the humidity goes down. You know, it might get, only be 50 or 60 or 70 percent humidity. But if you're storing honey, extracting honey, on capping, and you know, putting it on your pickup truck and hauling it to the honey house in real humid air. You're the whole the whole time you're adding moisture, so you need to be mindful of that. And we just counteract that with putting it in a drying room for two to three days, um, maybe four. Depends on the bugs and the hive beetles and stuff like that. Uh, some years when the hive beetles are really heavy, uh, we'll start to see activity in our supers in about four days. Keep in mind this is a very warm room, 85 or 90 degrees, perfect conditions for hive beetles. This year we saw almost none in our honey house. I don't, I, I don't know what, what you all saw, but we had a very low population of hive beetles this year, and I can't explain it. The humidity was there, the moi all the stuff they love was there. I just didn't see a bunch of them. Now we have made a, uh, a concerted effort to get more of our bee yards in full sun, and that does make a difference. If you hold your bee, bees in shade or even partial shade, you'll see a higher population of hive beetles. So. Um, that's something to be mindful of. When people come into the store and say, I've, I'm overrun with high beetles, what can I do? My first question is, are you in the shade? And it's uh, interesting how often they say, yeah, I'm in the shade. And they're doing it for their benefit, but the bees do better in full sun. Now, in Arizona, maybe that's not the case, but uh, where we're at, you know, the full sun's best. Uh, and I get the, you know, because of the YouTube videos I'm putting out, I get a lot of comments and questions and emails, and it's a surprising amount of them are about what do you do for hive beetles? We never see you doing anything, and the answer is we just keep good, strong colonies and try, don't leave anything, it's like, you know, if you don't want mice, don't leave food on the floor, you know, don't, don't, don't leave a, an environment for the hive beetles where they'll flourish, like colonies that are going queenless. And if you've got one colony that's queenless, that's the one that's loaded. And of course, if they get in there and start taking that thing over, then they, they populate the whole yard over time. So basically just keep your, your queenless colonies cleaned up. Don't let things get weak. That, that's very important for, uh, uh, dealing with high beetles, just keep things under control, and don't have more equipment than the bees can police. You know, you don't need four or five supers on a colony if there's not a honey flow, because the bees won't get up there and police that real well. And then uh, the type of equipment you have. A lot of people say that the plastic frames, you know, they have little holes in the end bars. They they say that's a good place for high beetles. I I say it makes sense. I don't experience that because I don't have plastic frames, but. It makes sense that if you have the type of equipment where high beetles can hide, that could be a problem too. What I was wondering about is the ventilation for the ventilation hole in the, in the hive. Do we make a ventilation for our hive? Is that yeah, the we, question? We, yeah, when you got the bucket on there. Is uh, it using migratory covers, not telescoping? Oh, I see. Yeah, we use a flat cover made out of so HDO don't have any ventilation at all in it? Okay. No, we don't. We don't purposely create ventilation. Uh, um, opportunities. Uh, now, if I lived north of here, you know, maybe up in Pennsylvania and north, I think I'd make sure I had ventilation holes. <clears throat> We're far enough south where it doesn't create a huge issue. Now, I'd, um, I'll explain that a little bit. Um, the worst scenario that can happen with moisture in a colony is when the, the, mo the condensation rises to the lid and it's cold enough outside to where it creates frost. It freezes on the underside of the lid. You know, like if you have three or four or whatever, how many weeks or months, depending on where you live, where it's really cold. 
and then you get a warm day and all of that melts and it just rains down on your clusters. And we don't have that problem here. It's not very common that we have our lids get so cold that it creates that uh, frost, if you want to call it that, on the inside of the lid. Now I leave my, my entrances wide open too. I don't put entrance reducers on my colonies because th that actually creates a little uh, airflow too, having a wide open entrance. And also on our pallets we have um, little holes in the back corners that are drain holes. So we, we have a little bit of cross ventilation across the bottom board. And I would readily admit that we have more moisture inside our colonies than somebody that had a ventilation hole or a screen bottom boards. Uh, most of you know I don't care for screen bottom boards, but my reasons are different than other people. You know, it's because we, well, I just won't go, I won't go into all the reasons for. for so you have some, uh, we have drain holes in the back on our pallets because our pallets we can't always face. There's colonies going both ways, so not knowing which way the colony is going to be tilted, we have to have drain holes in the back if rainwater those? runs in. How big are those? Uh, five eighths. Now this is a very interesting and very odd thing. We started out, you know, B space is three eighths, right? So I started out making three eighths holes in both the back corners on all four spots on my pallets. And uh, the bees just clogged them up just like that. So I started drilling half inch holes and they still propolis them and clogged them. And, and I drilled a 5 eighths hole and they don't plug them up. And I can't explain that honestly, but the 5 eighths hole, they leave it alone and they treat it like another entrance. But anything smaller, they seem to want to plug it up. So are you going to be feeding now any further? No, we're done. In fact, our last buckets are on the colonies and most of them are empty. And next week we'll be going around uh, picking all our empty buckets up and, uh, you know, putting, we put what we do in those lids is we just take a, a, a solid 70 millimeter cap off a quart jar and just plug the hole with it. And um, the reason we do the 70 millimeters is because sometimes we just like to put a five pound honey jar on to feed with. We don't need a bucket. And uh, uh, if you, if you, I don't know if you have been on my YouTube video channel, but about a month ago I put up a video on feeding bees and I explained in there about how we manipulate the activity of the colony with either more syrup or thin syrup or, or less syrup, how we stimulate them or don't stimulate them. And there are actually times when we only put one hole in a jar and put that in a lid and it's just a trickle flow and it's just a very slight stimulation. And especially with our nukes, we'll just give them one hole, just enough to stimulate them a little and make them rear a little brood. And uh, we, 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 we use feeding as a, a tool to manipulate the colony to do what we want. We don't just use feeding as a tool to just get them heavy. Uh, look at that video and you see we do a lot of trickery with our feeding. Uh, drawing foundation, you, there's certain uh, thicknesses of syrup. You know, certain recipes like 1.5 parts water to one part, part uh, um, sugar works really well for drawing foundation. Whereas if you do two parts sugar to one part water, they'll still draw foundation, but they plug the box out. When we're drawing foundation in summer and spring, we don't want to gain 60 pounds. We just want them to draw foundation. So there's a lot of things you can do with sugar syrup. So we want to be able to use both gla those smaller glass jars and one gallon buckets and two gallon buckets. And, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for all of that different stuff. Watch that video and it'll maybe make sense to you. You had a question? So his question, in case you couldn't hear, he's got a single story colony with nine frames in it. He's got six frames of honey and he's wondering if it's going to make it till, till the next honey flow. And I, absolutely not. If you've got six frames of food in there at this point, I just leave them alone and then maybe pick the feeding back up in the spring when you see them starting to get light again. Now in the spring when you start feeding, of course, you have to be aware that this feeding is going to stimulate them ahead of schedule and your, your window for swarming might be a couple of weeks earlier than it normally would be, especially if you're using thin syrup. Thin syrup is much more stimulating than thick syrup. Um, thin being anything below one and a half parts um, sugar to one part water. Our, our favorite feed for general feeding all the time is one to one. And when we're drawing a lot of foundation and don't want to gain weight and blow the colony out, we'll feed even thinner than that. So if you had to feed right now, I'd do at least two parts sugar to one part water 
and then you're pulling your moisture content only to 33, only 30, 33 percent in your syrup, and you know for the next couple of weeks they could deal with that. But pretty soon they're not even going to want to. That's even going to create a lot of extra moisture in your colony. So if you got six frames of food, I'd, I'd quit right now and wait till spring. Six frames in a single uh, should last you until February. See, when the bees start using a lot of food, a shocking amount of food once they start rearing brood, but when they go broodless, if one frame of honey will take them a long time. I don't know, uh, until they start rearing brood in late January or you know whenever they do for you, they'll probably get by on one or two frames of honey. But once that brood rearing starts, you better start paying attention. Yes, sir. Bob, uh, with the, all the rain that we had in the spring that kind of shut the nectar flow off, did you do any supplemental feeding, additional feeding than what you were doing? No, I didn't. His question is, did I supplemental feed during all the rain in the spring? We did up till the point where we actually had some bloom. Um, we, our colonies didn't lose weight during that time. They just simply didn't gain weight when they should have been gaining weight. We went into that rainy period with some weight on our colonies, so some of them got a little on the light side. Uh, you know, and they'd get a day now and a day then and get out and get some blackberry or something. It was a very interesting spring. They just didn't gain much weight until later into June, really. And so the, the short answer is no, we didn't supplement at that time because we had supers on. Um, I, I, you know, if, you, if you're listening to me talk, you understand that I feed a lot more than the average beekeeper, but we are very careful not to allow it to get in, us, in our honey. Once the supers are on, we're done feeding. Mm -hmm. If I feed, either the supers are coming off mm -hmm. or I'm very confident, extremely confident that they're so hungry that that feeder will go straight into the center of the brood nest because they're starving to death. I'm, I really, I'm really very careful about letting sugar get into my honey. You know, I, I always cringe when, you know, somebody calls the store or comes in and says, do you feed your bees sugar? Well, I know where they're going with that question. You know, they've read an article in a health food magazine that's told them, don't you, don't ever buy honey from a beekeeper that feeds his bees sugar because you can get sugar in your honey and it's bad for the bees and all this stuff. And um, I, I don't know how to answer that question properly for people because not only are we very careful to keep sugar out of our honey, but sucrose syrup is not bad for bees like some people think it is. It just isn't. I've, I've looked at this way too much. Ne incoming nectar is primarily sucrose, honestly. Um, so although, uh, you know, uh, honey, or I won't call it honey, food stores made from sucrose syrup by bees isn't exactly like honey because it doesn't have the mineral content but uh, it's not far off. You know, there, there's a lot of studies uh, in northern states, and they did one study out in California about feeding bees sucrose syrup before winter, you know, getting them ready for winter on 100% sucrose syrup and found that the bees did just as well as honey. And what really blew some people away is that in some instances they actually did better. Now when you go to the far north like right. Canada, they actually strive to take all the honey away from their bees and feed them back sucrose syrup because those minerals that we consider essential for our human health, uh, for winter food for bees, they don't want it because it's considered in, in undigestible elements that can cause dysentery because their bees don't get out and fly like ours do. Um, you know, up in some of those states, there might be a couple of months where the bees can't fly at all. Some of these guys in Canada put these bees in sheds. They don't fly for four or five months. That food has to be pristinely clean and free of foreign elements like minerals and, and things like that. The worst food for bees is very dark honey. Now, we have one of those here, and that's tulip poplar. Now, tulip, in our area, that's fine. Our bees fly. They get out and they can cleanse and dysentery doesn't become a problem because of that, that uh, higher uh, mineral content. But if I was overwintering in, um, you know, Manitoba or something like that, there's a few fellas I watch up there, Ontario, I wouldn't want any tulip poplar in my, uh, my food stores because those bees can't get out and defecate. It's going to mess them up. It's going to cause, it's going it's to aggravate nozema. And uh, our, the best 
we're really lucky here. Sourwood is an excellent overwintering food, and that's our last honey flow. And because for, for several, well, for two reasons, it has a very low mineral content, and it doesn't crystallize. So uh, it's an excellent overwintering food. But when you go to some of these northern states and they're trying to overwinter on uh, uh, fall asters and things like that and that are darker honey and have a lot of mineral content, it can really aggravate uh, uh, the, the guts of the bees and cause a lot of trouble. So don't be afraid of sucrose syrup. There, it really is not. The people that think that will tell you sucrose syrup is bad for your bees, I'm going to say it politely. I'm going to use an impolite word, but I'm going to try to say it politely. They're ignorant. You know, and I use the word ignorant, mean they just don't know. I don't mean they're stupid. They just, they just don't know. You know, I've just looked into this too much. There's just not, I, I don't see anything wrong with high quality sucrose syrup. I really don't. Don't be afraid of it. I have to be careful who, who I say that in front of. I, I might get, you know, knives thrown at me. You know, I did a little casual experiment uh, a long time ago. It was in Otto, up on uh, Hickory Knoll Road. I have a yard up there if you're familiar with it. And uh, this is a long time ago. I'm guessing at least 20 years. And I bought uh, some of those Starline Italians. Do you remember those bees? Mm -hmm. That was about the last, just at the end, where you could still get them you know, out of South Georgia. Very prolific, heavy brood layers. And then I, I had a yard of 24 colonies, or maybe it was 30. Anyway, I put half of them with those star lines, and the other half were Caucasians out of Mississippi. That man doesn't produce them anymore. They're not available, but uh, that time they were. And I ran them exactly the same, did all the treatments the same, feeding all, I did them just exactly the same. And at the end of the sourwood season, you could look across the yard and the, uh, those star lines all had another super or two. I mean, it was very dramatic. You could just see the stack, one or two supers higher, and I thought, they make more honey, simple as that. Well, I was working by myself. I didn't have the help I do now, and I had to stop and extract and sell some honey to get some money because I was broke. And it took me a few weeks to get back to do my treatments and stuff. When I went back in just three or four weeks, the star lines were starving to death, I kid you not. Some of them were on the brink, you know, moving real slow. They, they, they were just starving to death. And the Caucasians had 80 pounds of honey on them. So the star lines didn't make more honey. They just had a lot more brood and all the honey went up. Yeah. And the Caucasians were more, you know, I don't know what the right word would be, kind of confined everything in the brood nest. And the Carniolans do the same thing. I remember one year I bought some pretty good, pretty good strain of Carniolans that had come from somebody that was raising uh, Sue, Ke Sue Kobe's uh, New World Carniolans, and the bees were all dark. You could tell they'd done a really good job, and uh, it was a good sourwood year. And I was running singles in several yards that year with an excluder, and uh, made two or three supers of sourwood honey, which is a decent year, you know, across the whole yard. And I can remember taking the supers off and going, where's all the bees that made this honey? Yeah. You know, they didn't have, you know, 80,000 bees in the colony. You know, the, the small, and the, when I got into the brood nest, that, those Carniolans were, all their brood was just on five, six frames, maybe seven, and they still, you know, they had 20 or 30 pounds downstairs, and uh, that was my first introduction to Carniolans, and I really started to like that. And of course, I ran them through the winter in that single, and I didn't have to feed them till well, you know, into March or yeah. something. They really, and they overwintered with four frames of bees, which was scary, I thought. Yeah. You, know, this, you know, I was used to the Italians, four frames is not gonna make it, you know. I looked at those and I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll rebuild them next year. They all made it, and all, all went into swarm mode right on time. <laughs> the the, the Carniolans do something weird, uh, interesting, I should say. You know, the Italians overwinter with larger clusters, and, uh, you know, they, they, you, you think they're building up faster, but they're not. They just started out with more bees. At some point, midway through this, through this accelerated curve of buildup, 
those four frames of Carney Owens catch up with them, kind of. I, I, I don't know the answer to this. I, I should, I, you know, I run Carney Owens and Caucasian and stuff. I should know this, but I, I, there's somehow the Carney Owens seem to be able to keep more brood warm. I think that's part of their trick. Um, it might only, I'm just throwing out numbers, I don't know the real equation, but say five frames of Carniolan somehow can keep four frames of brood warm, where with the Italians they might only keep three frames of brood warm, so, so there's a point there where the Carniolans have a, a faster acceleration than the Italians, and by swarming season they seem to have kind of caught up. The, the difference in races is very interesting. Now, if I lived in South Georgia or Florida, you know, I'd say Italians is probably the way to go and just uh, be willing to feed them a bunch of sugar and just, you know, deal with the Italian traits. But here in the Appalachians, I, I kind of, my opinion is it's the wrong bee. Yeah. Oh, it's you've been talking about bees for almost an hour and hardly said the word might like once. Did you see anything significant? Uh, treatment's not working. Uh, yeah, his, his question is about mites. Did I see anything significantly different this year? And yeah, I kind of did, actually. Um, we, our typical um, technique for handling mites is to treat with Apivar in August, which is the correct time, by the way, to use that. If you're treating for mites once a year, you need to do it around the 1st of August. That's where you get the best overall results. We always would treat in early August with Apivar. Uh, in years past, I've used thymol occasionally too, and then we will do a oxalic vaporization when they're broodless in winter once or twice. And this year, the Apivar didn't work as well as it has in the past. And this year, after it was all over, we had a little higher mite count than I like to see. So uh, we're going to be looking real close. Uh, we're not going to hesitate. when We're watching for the day these beads go broodless so we can give them oxalic. We're in okay shape. I mean, uh, it's not like we're overrun with mites, but we have more than I like to see uh, normally. So. Um, I might start going back to thymol. Um, this Amitraz chemical that's in these Apivar strips, uh, you know, mites can develop somewhat of a resistance to that in time. And uh, we have not abused that chemical at all. I'm not one of those that's poured in chemicals into my colonies, so I haven't, you know, done that much that I think would build resistance. Plus, we, you know, we. We break that somewhat by treating with somewhat something else in winter, but I think I might go back to thym a thymol product of uh, one. Apigard works well if done properly. It works good in this area because um, our bees actually shut down a little bit in August. They don't go broodless, but Larry will tell you they go. They just taken a big dip in their brood production right after sourwood. Actually, they've already started that during sourwood. By mid-July, our bees don't have near the brood in them they had in mid-June. So if you can get a thymol treatment in, right, uh, in early August, and, uh, which will tend to shut the queen down, that's an okay time to do it because once you get it out of there, you know, by late August, the bees are starting what I call the fall buildup. Um, that's when they start raising bees for winter, and they do make a concerted effort to start rearing a little more brood again, especially when they start seeing that goldenrod coming in, goldenrod pollen. Oddly enough, pollen, a lot of folks don't realize this, that fresh incoming pollen is more stimulative than anything when it comes to rearing brood. You can pour all the thin syrup to them you want, but if you, know, if you want to compare that to fresh pollen coming in the door, there, there's really a big difference. You know, you, you've seen it when the first pollen comes in with the maple, kaboom, you know, full of brood. So that, uh, that uh, goldenrod pollen com coming in, if you can have all your mite treatments done and out of there before that happens, even though you lost a little brood production because of thymol or something like that, it, they'll bounce back. And, and if they're healthy and they come out of that phase really healthy, they'll actually surpass the level of bees and, and health, the degree of health and bee bodies in the colony that they would have had if they went through that phase a little bit compromised because your treatment didn't work well. Uh, yes, sir. I, I use thymol. Thymol? And I noticed, I thought my queens were not doing anything. Well, you're saying that the thymol can reduce their, okay, that's, that's, why that's your answer. Yeah, that's why your queens weren't laying much is because you had thymol in there. I thought Formic Pro does the same thing. Formic does the same thing, just shuts them down. Um, you have to be careful with both of those products. Um, 
uh, Ape of, or uh, Ape of Guard, which is uh, thymol gel, so to speak. If it's real warm, you, use, you need to use 50% dosage because if it's hot and you give them a full dose, not only can it shut the queen completely down, it can tend to run the bees out of the colony a little bit. Um, so when I'm doing thymol in August, when it's so hot, I use half doses, 50% dose. more often or do you still follow the same two weeks? I, st I still follow the do it once, wait 10 days and do it again routine okay. with thymol. You need to do it twice. The idea is that you need to be affecting that colony through one whole complete brood cycle. Um, there's so much, much misunderstanding when it comes to some of these organic uh, mite treatments and you know how many times and how close together and the biggest biggest thing I see is and there's actually what I thought were pretty smart people telling beekeepers that if you use oxalic vaporization in fall or late summer or any time and do it seven days apart three times in a row that you take care of your mite problem and that's completely incorrect because you just do the math when uh, when a mite hatches uh, that mite population begins to migrate back into cells that are going to be resealed within four days. Now some of them take much longer to enter a cell, but some of them start to go back in within four days. Well, if you wait to, for seven days to do your oxalic vaporization treatment, you've already lost. Some of those mites have already, they're lost until that next brood cycle hatches, you know. So um, if you're going to use oxalic acid vaporization as a treatment in late summer, I would recommend doing it every four or five days and doing it probably five or six times in a row. That's how you will get a really good effect on the mites with oxalic vaporization. Forget that business about every seven days to three times in a row. It's not good enough. It's not even close. Yeah, I'll tell you a fun story that happened to me down in, in middle Georgia in the summertime. Um, this was a long time ago too. I was using Apigard and I, I was running my bees as a deep and a shallow. That was the brood nest. And it was just after the cotton and stuff was over. It was probably late August or mid-September, somewhere in there. But still plenty hot down in South Georgia. This was down around Cordell. It's, it's not really middle, it's a little south of middle Georgia. And anybody that's spent any time down there in the summer knows that it's a miserable place to be. I don't know how those people live down there, honestly. <laughs> I, I don't know how they keep bees down there. My goodness, it's so hot and humid. Anyway, I just followed the directions. You know, the, even the directions said you could go up to 92 degrees. I forget what it said now, but I just laid them a full dose in there and uh, did probably 300 colonies and then went home and came back about a... Uh, 10 days later to check on them and do it again and half the bees were completely ruined uh, Some of them had completely left the box and moved in under the pallet and the hive beetles had taken over the colony Apparently hive beetles don't have any problem with Apigard because they just came in and slimed the place and the bees were under the pallet building comb trying to get along and some colonies were just completely ruined. I just had to blow the bees out and bring the boxes home. And hive beetles just slimed everything in sight. It was a terrible mess. So in hindsight, now that I know, that should have been a half a dose. And I should have maybe even less. It was probably, probably got into the mid-90s down there over that, that time period. Way too hot for thymol at full dose. So you got to be careful with that stuff. And Formic too. Formic's very heat sensitive. You need, to, you need to check your mite populations. Get you one of those check mite kits or whatever they're, what are those kits called, Seth? Check something. Mite, mite check rower. maybe? Yeah, mite yeah check. a little plastic thing where you put the alcohol. They're only 20 bucks or 20 something. It's worth the investment to know where, if you're serious about keeping your bees alive, you should know what your mite count is. You know, check them several times a year. Don't just assume that you're in good shape. Check them out. Um, especially going into winter, or late summer, early fall, make sure whatever you did, whether it's thymol or apivar or whatever, actually worked and before you just put them to bed. Because if it didn't work, you may still have time to do something else to get everything under control. The 
moths. Wax moths? Yeah. Uh, most new beekeepers that have wax moth trouble think that the wax moths are taking over their colonies, and that's incorrect. Wax moths are a sent symptom. They're not the problem. They're a symptom of a weak colony or a queenless colony. Your colony is already compromised when wax moths start to take over. Or if you don't have a large colony and you put too much equipment on and the bees aren't able to police the whole stack and you know keep it clear, uh, like say you only have a small nuke or a six frame, four frame colony and in, uh, in you know five or six boxes, sometimes the outer reaches can start to get taken over by wax moth because the bees aren't able to police it. So I recommend not, in warm weather, don't stack on a bunch of equipment. Now in the winter, a lot of people will have a single or a double or whatever they run as a brood chamber with an inner cover with that hole in it and they'll put a couple supers above it just so the bees can police it and take care of it over winter. That works in cold weather, but it doesn't work in warm weather. Yes, sir. Did you ever hear that um, rumor that uh, uh, beekeepers are less chance to get COVID? I have heard a rumor that beekeepers and of course, we're listening to 20th hand information, so who knows if it's. As beekeepers, we like to think that we're immune to everything. You know, if you get stung enough, you know, that takes care of everything, right? Uh, there could be a little bit to it um, if you eat a lot of honey. Um, honey is anti a lot of stuff, antimicrobial. I actually actually went through a period of time where I was chewing propolis every day. Seth was watching me do this. He thought that was very curious. Uh, I just I would just find a colony with it's propolis and scrape it right off and chew on it all day like chewing gum. And I went through about a month or month and a half where I was doing that every day. Maybe that helped me get through it. I don't know. Um, oh yeah, straight just out of straight out of the box. <laughs> yeah. We have some, you know, with this little bit of Caucasian blood moving in, we have plenty of propolis, trust me. <laughs> Propolis is highly antimicrobial yeah. and uh, you know in, in past years, past decades, for maybe the past century, I don't know, we've been trying to breed bees that don't propolis so much and uh, you know these recent studies are showing that's really a big mistake. Uh, the colonies that have a high degree of propolis are, are healthier, they're doing better. Marla Spivak up there in Minnesota, she's been doing some good studies on propolis and finding out that colonies that have a good a good shellacking of propolis in their cavity do much better with all these little, even things like foul brood, uh, uh, European foul brood, much better. So that's one of the reasons I've been trying to introduce Caucasian blood back into my outfit is the, I don't want to, I had Caucasians back in the 80s and the 90s and honestly the propolis at times was just a bit much. I mean it was just like, you know, you'd come, you, you could scrape it off your fingers with a hive tool and everything you touched, it was everywhere. I, I'd get in the truck and my steering wheel was covered in it. And, and I kind of moved away from it, but now I'm trying to find that happy medium where they've got a lot of propolis, but not that excessive. And that's where we're, what we're shooting for at the moment. We're kind of shooting for a Caucasian carnial and cross at the moment. We'll see how that goes. Well, you know, you've been a small crowd, but your questions have been pretty good. <laughs> so this is a quality group. And this was very nice. I didn't know what to expect with a handful of people, but somehow, Somehow we've gotten some good subject I really matter out. I appreciate you guys showing up and, you know. Okay. I will see you in December and I will look forward to your email and your reminder phone call. Yeah. <laughs>